Once every people in the world believed that trees were divine and could take a human or grotesque shape and dance among the shadows and that deer and ravens and foxes and wolves and bears and clouds and pools, almost all things under the sun and moon and the sun and moon were not less divine and changeable. They saw in the rainbow the still bent bow of a god thrown down in his negligence. They heard in the thunder the sound of his beaten water jar or the tumult of his chariot wheels. And when a sudden flight of wild duck or of crows passed over their heads, they thought they were gazing at the dead hastening to their rest while they dreamed of so great a mystery in little things that they believed the waving of a hand or of a sacred bow enough to trouble far-off hearts or hood the moon with darkness. This was written by W.B. Yeats in 1903 and it's a very evocative description of folk magic and folk divination. Hello, I'm Yvonne Abro. I'm Bob Houghton. We're here to talk to you about folk divination with particular emphasis on the folk divination practices of Scotland. So what is divination? The word is related to divinity and means consulting the gods or spirits. Typically, divination is interpreting seemingly random patterns to find out hidden information, such as what will happen in the future, finding lost things, or understanding the hidden causes of things. Why do people do divination? Generally, because they want to know what will happen, where they can find lost or hidden things, who stole their treasure, or what caused a recent calamity. Okay. Examples include uh, finding out the identity of your future spouse, hopefully the same person as your true love, whether you or your friends uh, will survive the coming year, what sex your baby will be, if the harvest will succeed or fail, whether you'll have nice weather on your wedding day, which could also be a portent of the marriage itself, and who stole your precious ring. My precious. Yes. People do divination or dowsing to find stolen goods, lost car keys, lost relatives, underground water and more. And here we have an illustration of the sieve and shears method, uh, which it's not quite clear how this works. My theory is that you place the shears on top of the sieve and then spin them around. Um, there aren't any known instances of this being used in Scotland, but maybe they're out there somewhere. So... People do divination to find out why things happened. Why did the crops fail? Why did I fall ill? Why can't I get pregnant? And other mysterious and confusing events. So let's look at different types of divination. There are many different types of divination. People have used the flight of birds, the patterns of entrails, the direction of the wind, cards, tea leaves, coffee grounds, and many other things. Here we will focus on some common ones and then turn to specifically Scottish methods. Some common examples include cards, as in playing cards or tarot cards, tea leaves, runes, bones, dice, palm reading, astrology, or the previously mentioned sieve and shears method. You can also divine using molten tin or lead or candle wax poured into water. This is often done at New Year's Eve or at Samhain. And there's also the New Year's walk, which is a Swedish custom, where you take a silent walk to the ch nearby churchyard between Yule and New Year's and observe whatever noises or sights you might encounter. And these will be a uh, omen for the coming year. We tried this last year. Mm -hmm. um, results were inconclusive, but we're going to try it again. So examples of divination methods for finding hidden or lost things include the pendulum, dowsing, water divining, 
pictured here from a medieval illustration. Um, and scrying and sieve and shears. The pendulum can be used for map dowsing or dowsing a physical location. One traditional method involves using a wedding ring or a strand of hair. Uh, you take the strand of hair and tie the wedding ring on the end and then use it as a dowsing pendulum. And this is used to divine the sex of a baby in the womb. And dowsing rods are usually used for finding water underground. Now, scrying, uh, it involves seeing or seeking to see pictures or patterns in a neutral surface, such as in a black mirror or in water or in a dark ink. And people usually use a candle to um, set behind them whilst gazing and trying to put your eyes out of focus while gazing into the dark surface. There were several uniquely Scottish divination practices, which we will examine over the next few slides. These included luggy bowls, sweetheart nuts, salted herring, kale stalks, sark washing, pictured here, the spiel bone, the frith, and pricking your thumbs with holly. Okay, luggy bowls. The use of luggy bowls is a Halloween divination, so named because the bowls had a handle on either side resembling ears, colloquially, colloquially referred to as lugs. The player is blindfolded and chooses a bowl. The one she chooses will determine her romantic fate. If the bowl is full of clean water, she will marry within the year. If it's full of soapy water, she will marry an old but rich man. And if you get an empty bowl, well, you'll never marry. For the man, if he picked a bowl of clean water, he would be destined to marry a virgin. A bowl of dirty water meant he would marry a widow, and an empty bowl, again, would mean he would never marry at all. Someone needs to devise a version of this custom for non-binary people. I'll get to it. <laughs> Halloween divination practices. Um, another one of these is the sweetheart nuts, burning the sweetheart nuts. This was performed by unmarried people to see if they were destined to be with the person they admired. You take two hazelnuts, you name one for yourself and the other for the object of your affection. You place them in the embers of a fire and speak this charm. If you hate me, spit and fly. If you love me, burn away. If the nuts jump from the heat, then it foretells an unhappy future for the two people in question. If they burn quietly, then the couple are seen as a good match for each other. Then there's the custom of salted herring on the island of Lewis. You eat salted herring on Halloween in the hopes of dreaming of a future spouse that night. Probably would give you bad dreams of some sort. Hail stalks. The company set off for a field where they were blindfolded and moved across the field pulling kale stalks after dark. If the stalk was crooked or straight, long or short, this would be the status statue of their future spouse. Sometimes a lad and lass who were courting held hands and pulled a kale stalk together. If it had plenty of good rich earth around its roots, their future would be prosperous. Uh, this comes from the book known uh, Scottish Festivals by Sheila Livingstone. Another custom was sark washing. This was found in Shetland and on Halloween, if a girl washed a man's sark, his shirt, in a burn where a funeral beer had crossed and sang a certain song, the first person to appear and grip the shirt would be her future husband. On the Isle of Lewis, they practiced divination using the shoulder blade bone of a black sheep which was procured by the querent, who would then seek out a local seer. The seer then held the bone lengthwise in front of him and in the direction of the greatest length of the island. He then began to read the bone for any marks that he saw on it and used them to foretell events that, would, that were uh, to happen to individuals or families. Second Sight has two names in Gaelic. The first refers to the ability to see the world of the dead and the living at the same time. 
and the second uh, is refers to wraith seeing or ghost seeing. According to tradition, the fair folk, the people of the other world, would give the seer the sight for a particular purpose. Evidence from the witch trials suggests that the sight was offered in times of need. More unusually, the gift of second sight could be associated with some lifelong deformity or disability. These were considered marks of the other world. Having the second sight was considered unfortunate. According to folklore, the second sight is granted by the other world almost exclusively and allows the seer to foresee the outcomes of people far away or those who are due to die. And pictured here, we have the beautiful mountain of Shehalion uh, in Perthshire, known as the home of the fair folk. Uh, so she from the Gaelic, she meaning the, the fair folk. So, Tagem. According to Robert Archibald Armstrong, writing in 1825, the form of divination known as Tagem was once a noted superstition in the Highlands and in the northern parts of the lowlands of Scotland, and it was also known in Wales. When any important question arose, an unfortunate individual was selected by their neighbours to perform the part of a prophet. This person was wrapped in the warm smoking hide of a newly slain ox or cow and laid at full length on a rock ledge behind a waterfall. Now, sources aren't quite clear whether it's in one of those waterfalls where the person is like can actually lay on a ledge behind the waterfall or whether the person is actually in the torrent itself. Um, either way sounds uncomfortable. So once they're there in the waterfall wrapped in their smoking ox hide, the question is then put to them and they were left alone to consider it. They would lie for several hours with the warm hide wrapped around them, presumably getting progressively colder, deafened by the incessant roaring of the waterfall. In this extreme state where all the person's senses were assaulted by noise and discomfort, any insights gained were thought to be prophetic. Another is uh, seeing stones. Seeing stones were used for seeing the future all over the British Isles and also for warding off harmful people or energies. They were still being used as a device for warding off baneful influences to cattle in Hampshire of, in England as late as the 1950s. Now, holly. Uh, holly was used generally by boys for divination. They would deliberately prick their thumbs with the sharp edge of the leaves and then count the drops of blood as they fell. Each drop equal a year of their lives and they would forecast when they would die. There were many types of magical folk in Scotland, the Spaywife, the Frithier, and the Tyveshire, and many historical examples of individuals with uncanny powers. We turn now to look at these. A spaywife is a female prophetess, a seer, a diviner. In Norse culture, she was called a spaykona, a seeress, and stories of such women are found throughout Norse mythology. The Volva's practice involved spay, and in an account called Volospe, the prophecy of the Volva, which is the first poem of the poetic Edda, Odin, the father of the gods, consulted a Volva to find out what was going to happen to all the gods. And of course, she famously predicted Ragnarok. In Scottish belief, a spay wife was not the same as a witch. Spay wives were seen as practicing a natural gift, Witches were believed to be practicing black magic. According to F. Marion McNeil in The Silver Bow, the first Monday of the quarter day was considered the most auspicious day for making the frith, which was a divination practice, and a form of magical horoscope or divination which allowed the frithier to see into the unseen in order to ascertain the whereabouts and the condition of the absent or the lost, whether man or beast. People with the sight 
are regarded as spectre haunted or literally wraith seers. They would see the wraiths or fetches of living people as well as the ghosts of the dead. The wraith might show how they were going to die or how they'd already died, perhaps by drowning. Different wraith seers would interpret these scenes differently as skill permitted. Failure to manage the second site correctly might cause the seer to be haunted by spectres. This haunting would drive the seer mad on occasion. Genuine wraith seers take precautions to prevent this. For example, they won't walk down the middle of the road or path at night in case they are run over by some phantom. According to folklore, the Brehan seer, uh, Kenneth the Sallow, was born Kenneth Mackenzie on the island of Lewis around the beginning of the 17th century. He lived at Lahosi near Dingwall in Russia and worked as a laborer on the Brehan estate, seat of the Seaforth chieftains, from somewhere around 1675. According to legend, it was through his mother that Kenneth the Sallow was given the site. At a graveyard one night when ghosts were known to roam the earth, his mother encountered the ghost of a Danish priestess on her way back to her grave. In order to allow the princess to return to her grave, Kenneth's mother demanded that the princess give her son the second sight. Later that same day, Kenneth found a small stone with, with a hole in the middle of it with which he could see his visions. Robert Kirk was a 17th century minister, Gaelic scholar and folklorist, best known for the Secret Commonwealth, a treatise on fairy folklore, witchcraft, ghosts and second sight. Folklorists Stuart Sanderson and mythologist Marina Warner called Kirk's collection of supernatural tales one of the most important and significant works on the subject of fairies and second sight. Janet Douglas, a 17th century seer, was able to determine if people had been harmed by sorcerous artifacts. At the age of 11, she traveled to Glasgow, where her fame had preceded her, and she was greeted by a large number of people. In the crowd, there was a goldsmith who had been unsuccessful in his trade. Janet Douglas told him that his lack of success was due to an image that had been made against him, which he could find in the corner of his shop. When the goldsmith went home, he found the image, which had been made of clay, exactly where the seer had told him it would be. Mary Campbell was a Scottish soothsayer from the late 17th century. Her existence is disputed. She was the daughter of Sir James Campbell, fourth of Laws, and lived in a farm near Loch Tay, Perthshire. Seems to have a good pedigree for somebody whose existence was disputed. She married John Stuart of the Appin family in Argyleshire. She correctly predicted a church roof falling and the Bradlebane family leaving the area on a grey pony, which they did. Daniel Douglas Hume uh, was a medium who was said to be able to levitate and perform acts of telekinesis. Even as a baby, lights were seen floating around his crib as an unseen person rocked the baby to sleep. His mother, Elizabeth, was a well-known seer, as were two of his uncles. Spooky. Mm. Helen Duncan, arguably Scotland's most famous medium, she was also the last person to be prosecuted under the Witchcraft Act, which was repealed in 1951. The reason she was pr prosecuted was that the government was worried that she would reveal the secret locations of shipping. Obviously, her mediumship was too good. Mm -hmm. and born in Elgin in 1931, Swain MacDonald experienced visions from childhood. He believed he inherited this ability from his grandfather. As a young boy, he was said to have foreseen a local man being injured by falling off his cart. He also claimed to have seen a tall, dark man wearing a veil walking down the road whom a neighbor could not see as well. Then Swain described the figure uh, to his mother, and she told him that it was of an old neighbor who had just died in London.
We would now like to demonstrate some of the techniques that we were talking about in the presentation. First up, we'd like to demonstrate the pouring of candle wax. We've been saving candle ends and bits of drip wax drippings uh, in, uh, in a cup over the past weeks and put them in a saucepan on the stove to melt them. And here we go, let's see what we get. Okay, we've got two areas of wax. Um, one of them kind of looks like a crescent moon. Yeah. And the other one, I don't know, could it be a green man, do you think? I don't know, uh, everybody will see something slightly different, something that's relevant to yourself. Yes. For me, I see, looks like a dragon. It does look a bit like a dragon too, yes. yes. Yeah, so dragons are uh, spirits of the earth that like to um, bring energy and blessing. So, and there are also spirits of water in China. So, interpretation of that, up to you. Next up is divination with tea leaves. So you get some tea leaves and swish them about in your cup and see if you can get a shape. Oh, well, it kind of looks like a tree. Um, maybe a tree that's shedding its leaves in autumn. So that's very appropriate because it's autumn right now. Next up is scrying through a hagstone or seeing stone. This technique is also mentioned in The Secret Commonwealth by Robert Kirk. So let's see what happens. Perhaps what's required is taking off the glasses. Ah. Having it directly up to your eye. Next up, scrying with ink. So we have a bowl of ink diluted with water here and I'm going to try scrying into it. So the idea is to get the candle reflected in the ink, which I now have, and then defocus your eyes. Again, taking my glasses off might help. And all I can see is the candle flame reflected in the ink. But it looks cool. We're now going to demonstrate pendulum dowsing. So pendulum dowsing is very accessible because you can use any weight and any bit of string. And the neat thing about pendulum dowsing is that the pendulum itself is like a needle on, a, on an oscilloscope and it's just all it's doing is amplifying the, mi the minute vibrations that are sent down your arm by your subconscious. So the first thing to do when you start pendulum dowsing is to establish what's your yes and what's your no. So I'm going to think very hard about yes. Okay, so what's my yes today? And it's a good idea to do this every time you do a, d a dowsing session because your yes and your no can change. So today my yes is a clockwise circle. All right, and then I'm going to steady the pendulum and I'm going to, what is my no? So my no is a straight line backwards and forwards. Okay, that's good. 
Right, now when you're doing um, dowsing of some of the sex of a, an unborn baby, um, the idea is to um, to place the pendulum and, and traditionally, as mentioned, it's a wedding ring on a, on a strand of hair, preferably the wedding ring and the hair of the person you're, whose tummy you are dowsing. So you place your pendulum over the tummy of the pregnant person. Um, I'm not pregnant, so this will be a demonstration only. Um, and you start to douse um, and generally speaking, uh, if the child is physically female, you will get um, a circular motion like that. Um, and if the child is physically male, you generally get a backwards and forwards motion. Now, this is completely unrelated to the yes and no that I just demonstrated. Um, these just seem to be the general thing of a male and female. However, as with the yes and no, it's a good idea to, um, to test it out on a physical person to see if your male and female signals are the same. So I'm now going to have a go at map dowsing. Uh, so I will get the map. Here's a map. And this is a map of Ontario. So um, now I already know where Bob was born. Uh, so I'm going to douse the map to see if I can figure out where he was born. Okay, so, or to see if this works, right? So uh, clearly not Waterloo. Well, well, actually I should do, um, let's see. Okay, I am getting a different motion for Hamilton, which is where he was born. I'm gonna test other parts of the map. All right, I'm getting a circular motion. All right, and all right, so clearly my yes or no thing has now gone out of the window. I'm getting circular motions for the rest of the map. And then let's see what happens if I go over Hamilton again, again, backwards and forwards. Now, of course, the real test of this particular one would be if I did it with my eyes shut. So let's try that. And my arm's starting to ache now. Feels like I'm getting a different motion, but I can't tell. So who knows? Yep. So there's a few ideas for dowsing, and you can also douse for lost things around the house, and water in the garden, uh, or water in the landscape. Next up, we have scrying with a bone. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the shoulder blade bone of a black sheep, so, but we do have this very attractive piece of antler. So I'm going to try with this. Now I'm sitting with, facing uh, in an east-west direction, and um, I'm gonna try, so I'm holding the, the antler in the direction um, of the full length of Canada, and I'm going to try scrying along the bone. So I will remove my glasses and let's have a look. So there's an interesting pattern on the antler here. Um, kind of looks like some lakes maybe, uh, or maybe some hills, could be a horse. And I'm just gonna look further along the bone and I'm seeing a crack in the antler and if as I get closer to it it seems to divide into two paths due to the parallax effect and maybe this is something to do with the Seven Friars prophecy of the Anishinaabe who saw two paths diverging 
Um, so that's interesting. So this seems to be a pretty effective means of divination, especially as my eyes are very definitely out of focus and I'm seeing all sorts of patterns in the bone. And now runic divination. So the runes are an ancient system of writing used by Norse peoples and this particular set is a set of Northumbrian runes. The Northumbrian rune uh, Futhark had 33 runes, the Old English or Anglo-Saxon Futhark had 28 runes and the classic Elder Futhark had 24 runes. The Younger Futhark has 16 or 18, I forget which. So this set has an extra nine runes in it, uh, which are mainly to do with um, spiritual matters. So an ideal set for doing a divination for the success of this event, which I hope will be very successful. So let's have a look. I'm going to just massage the runes gently to ask them the question. So the past of this event. Oh. The present of this event. Good. The future of this event. Hmm, excellent. Okay, so the three runes that came out were payoff the the mysteries so it springs from the mysteries which is great because that's what we're all here to explore then the middle one is gebo or gifu which means exchange an exchange of gifts exactly what happens at a conference where we're sharing knowledge and information and hopefully friendship and the future is the ubo and this is an interesting one because it is a weapon, but it's also used for feeding the people because it's a weapon of hunting. Um, so um, I would take this as, uh, and it could also be to do with protection. So um, I wish you protection and to be well fed and well provisioned. We hope you enjoyed these practical demonstrations of divination and will be feel inspired to have a go. If you have any questions, uh, you can reach us on the social media links which are provided in the final slide of the presentation. Have a great day. Yes. People have always wanted to lessen the uncertainty of life. And so they turned to divination seers and spaywives. They have always found hidden connections between things and had visions of the dead, the fair folk and the hidden causes of things. They have always discerned patterns in the leaves, the snow, the waters and the wind. If any of these topics has caught your interest, maybe we recommend a few sites for you to check out. One is the Kaliak Herbarium, which is a website, a website of Scottish folk magic. There's also Hag of the Hills, which is a Scottish folklore blog. There's Folklore Th T Thursdays, which is a general folklore blog, podcast, and hashtag for sharing interesting folklore. Helen Duncan has a website devoted to her. Uh, everything you ever wanted to know about Helen Duncan. Uh, and F. Marion McNeil's The Silver Bow is a classic work on Scottish folklore, which is available um, um, online. Online, okay in good bookshops and we also used uh, Kylie X Herbarium and Hag of the Hills uh, as sources in this presentation so mm -hmm. thank you very much to the authors of those two uh, blogs also available on sacredtext.com and for purchase as a physical book um, The Secret Commonwealth 
is one of the most sought after and enigmatic enigmatic texts about Celtic fairies. Written by the aforementioned Scottish clergyman Robert Kirk in 1691 and not committed to print until the early 19th century, The Secret Commonwealth is an unusually sympathetic account of the denizens of fairyland and a complex of still mysterious extrasensory phenomena, including poltergeists, clairvoyants and doppelgangers, here known as co-walkers. So... That's it for today. Thank you for coming to our talk. Check out our other work on YouTube, uh, through Instagram, and for you, wherever books are sold. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming to our talk. And we'd like to reassure you that no healing coups were harmed in the making of this presentation. <laughs>